All right. Welcome everyone to a very special after hours episode of the Back to Square Quant podcast. So usually in this podcast, we talk a lot about like fitness, right? We predominantly fitness content, it's a little bit of philosophy here, but this episode, it's going to be pretty different because it's probably not going to be about fitness at all. So if you're here for um, fitness, uh, maybe you may want to wait for the next episode to come out. But today, we, I actually have a professor of philosophy, um, uh, Dr. Terence Cuno. Um, he will be, yeah, we'll be talking about things that, uh, re- that, that's related to morality, uh, ethics, and all the fun philosophical stuff. So yeah, welcome, uh, Dr. Terence. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so just a little bit of background. I'm just going to briefly sketch out your background. So feel free to add in anything that I missed out. And also maybe share with us a little bit of some of the projects that you're currently working on. Uh, So you are a professor at the University of Vermont, right? And you work primarily in the field of uh, metaethics, right? So maybe we can define what metaethics is later. And you are, I mean, you also work a little bit on stuff like, uh, on like Thomas Reed. I know that you, uh, you, you've you've written like books and like papers on read and things related to like uh, liturgy as well. So is there anything I'm missing out, anything that you want to share with our audience? No, that's right. I primarily work in three areas and meta ethics and history of modern philosophy. Thomas Reed is the figure I tend to focus on. Um, and also I work in the philosophy of religion and my work there is primarily on um, um uh, philosophy of liturgy, ritual, that kind of thing. Yep. Something I also noticed that uh, the, the work you do is quite similar to uh, Nicholas Walterstoff, right? So oh. I first like stumbled upon uh, your work because I, in, in my kind of like pursuit of knowing about uh, morality, human rights, things like that, you know, uh, I stumbled upon, uh, my. It, it's funny because my introduction was actually looking at Michael Sandel's book called Justice, right? And uh-huh. then yep. the, the title is very similar to like Walter Stoff's book, right? Uh, Justice, yep. right? So I stumbled upon that. And then oh, before buying any books, I usually look at reviews. Uh, and then I saw you re- reviewing some of, you You gave a review of, of his book. And then I looked at your work and like you have like, yeah, quite simi- uh, similar stuff. Like Walter Stoff uh, writes about morality as well. He also does uh, read some stuff and read. And if I'm not mistaken, he also did uh, some stuff on like speech act related stuff. I can't remember the technical term, which you also did. You actually wrote a book called Speech and Morality. So yeah, yeah. very similar to what Walter Stoff does. Uh, was he, like, did you study under Walter Stoff? Yeah, oh. yep. that's right. He was my mentor. So this is <laughs> predictable. Yeah, yeah, th- th- that's great. Because I, I really enjoyed his, his book. I think it was a, it's a really good piece uh, yeah, the, you know, as, especially yeah, the first one. I've I haven't read the others. You know, that's like uh, justice mm-hmm. and love. I've not read that, so uh, it's yep, definitely on my reading list uh, among many many other uh, books. You know, so if when we are discussing about meta ethics and morality, I think as a philosopher, you know, uh, going back to the tradition of Socrates, it's very important to define our terms, right? Socrates, we just go into the public, ask asking people, what do you mean by this? So. Uh, I spoke to a friend uh, who did her PhD in moral psychology and I said, oh, what is morality as a moral psychologist? How will you define it? And she said, oh, uh, the short version is uh, determining what is right and wrong. So but that, that comes from a moral psycho- uh, psychology point of view. And I know that there's some form of distinction between like philosophy and psychology. So as actually a meta ethician, a moral philosopher, how would you define morality? Oh, like a lot of philosophers on this topic, I tend to take the coward's way out. Um, (laughs) Most philosophers um, don't really bother trying to define morality. It proves to be pretty difficult to identify anything like a a compelling definition of what morality is. Um, Instead, what they tend to do is work with focal cases of the moral domain. So we were just talking about justice, and I think most philosophers would agree that justice is a moral concept. It's one of the focal moral concepts, but also being morally required, being morally prohibited, being morally permissible, 
uh, being kind, being benevolent, these are all concepts. These are all moral concepts. And so the thinking is that we, we kind of work with the focal cases, the paradigm cases, and um, we, can, we can do well enough even without having defined what morality is. In many cases, philosophers find themselves having to do this sort of thing. So for example, people work in philosophy of art well, it turns out that it's extremely difficult to offer anything like a compelling definition of what art is. So uh, what ends up happening uh, often is um, work with paradigm cases of, of art and, and work from there. Metaethics is, as um, the term suggests, a field, a subfield of ethics in which philosophers address questions about morality. So questions about um, uh, whether there is any moral reality, any moral truths, any moral facts, what they're like, how we might know them, what their source is, if anything, what kind of relations they bear to action and motivation and believing, what's the nature of moral thought and discourse. These are all the sorts of questions that meta-ethicists focus on. So they're strictly speaking, higher order questions about morality. So they're not in the first instance, at least, addressing questions such as which particular actions are right and wrong, but they're asking higher order questions like, huh, are there any actions that are right and wrong? And if so, what would they be like? Yep. So I guess uh, there would, yeah. So I guess when it comes to sort of like uh, knowing what's right and wrong, the question of whether something is good or bad also plays a role in it. Right? You know, like uh, we mentioned, like justice just now, right? Benevolence. You know, we think that those fall into like the moral domain because we do see some form of so sort of like goodness uh, with those. Like you know, if you want to say like properties right for example uh and but then again goodness is another uh thing that's quite hard to define right in uh the principia uh, ethica by more uh, he said that you know there's this open question argument that you can't not like good what is good is kind of like hard to define you know so uh and so how would you then like i mean define good or respond to more in that sense yeah. Um, well, you're opening up a, a, with a, a couple of big questions here. Um, so we probably want to distinguish um, the property of being good from the property of being morally good. Yep. Um, Moore himself seems to want to talk about good um, as opposed to just narrowing his focus on what's morally good. But um more, more says some things that I think are uh, controversial, probably not correct. And some other things that I think are quite provocative and quite interesting and may very well be correct. So I, I think what might be correct in, in, in more is, is the thought that we can't offer anything like a naturalistic definition of good. So you could offer a uh, definition of good that goes something like this, like um, the good is that which merits approbation or when, what, what one ought to uh, approve of or desire or love or prize or that kind of thing. That might function as a pretty good definition of, of, the, of, of good. Um, but what Moore was after was the idea that um, offering a definition that appeals to so-called naturalistic concepts, only naturalistic concepts, where Moore is thinking about naturalistic concepts roughly as those concepts that pull their weight in the natural sciences. So think about mass and charge and uh, um, um, uh, genome and so forth. <laughs> Um, but also in psychology, if you're going to broaden our understanding of the sciences, so they encompass um, the softer sciences like psychology and perhaps sociology, um, um, the sorts of concepts that psych psychologists like to use, um, where these are often uh, concepts with regard to mental states like belief, desire, so on. 
pleasure or pain. And so his thinking is, you're not going to offer uh, a definition of um, a moral property such as good in terms of um, these naturalistic these naturalistic features. That's that's his thinking. I think he's probably right about that, but um, this is somewhat controversial. Yeah. Um... I mean, there are like multiple people who like obviously responded to more as well. I'm just like curious to get your thoughts on it, right? So uh, if people want to look up more uh, open question argument, uh, people can go ahead. And some people even say that, yeah, it's not really as decisive as like cool dislike. It's like uh, completely obliterates like, oh, the definition. But I think it poses like a challenge for people to define good in a certain way rather than saying that good is completely undefinable. So at least that's kind of like how I, I look at look at Moore's question, uh, and I think that something that is uh, you know because people use all these terms, uh, I mean, very loosely every day. Oh, you know this is good, but only the like the philosophers you know, spend time and like think uh, for for better or worse, right? Just think about oh, what does good mean, you know, and yeah. all, all of that kind of thing. So I I, I do think that it is quite a uh, interesting thing to just like talk about it, you know, stir up. Uh, thoughts in people's head heads and now when we we roughly sketched out what morality roughly is or isn't you know and then now we, we also talked about the good and moving a little bit into the meta ethical sphere we have different positions right so to first uh actually to first like go down that route we probably have to start talking about uh truth right whether like is any is like are there such things as moral facts, right? Or is, uh, is there any there's such things as moral truth uh, in in the scholarly work, right? Do you say is, is morality like if truth at right? So you have the position of the cognitivist and the non-cognitivist, right? So the non-cognitivist would say that uh, it, morality is not truth at, which means that you just, uh, for example, AJA, right, uh, kind of like expresses morality as a like a feeling of disapproval or emotion right and so in 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 that camp right so what do you uh think of positions like that such as morality is not truth at, at all so uh yeah yeah the way we philosophers would put it it's not so much that morality itself is not true god but the thinking is that uh, uh moral thought uh, the content of moral thought or the content of moral discourse is not truth apt. Um, so we can think of uh, lots of modes of discourse that are not truth apt. And what that means is, is it's just the sort of thing that's not apt for truth, not the sort of thing we can uh, um, say is a candidate for being true or false. So think about questions or commands or expressions of feeling. If I say, hey, uh, uh, go take out the garbage, that is not, um, the content of that is not the sort of thing that could be true or false, okay? So, or you know, what's for dinner tonight? That question, the content is, is not such that it could be true or false. There, there's a school in metaethics which says that um, moral discourse is not truth apt. Uh, error was AJ error. You mentioned when, way back when early uh, 20th century was sort of the pioneer of this view. And um, there might, might be precursors uh, previous to error. Some people read Hume as advocating a view like this. But Ayer articulates the view very clearly that he thinks that, no, no, moral sentences are expressions of attitude, expressions of feelings of certain kinds. So if I utter the sentence, hey, murder is wrong, what Ayer wants to say is that what the sentence really expresses is something like this, boo to murder, <laughs> um, um, in which you're, the, the utterer of the sentence is expressing his um, aversion to and disapproval of, of murder. And Buddha murder is just not the sort of thing that can be truth out. Now, Ayer's view has come under a lot of fire. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find philosophers who go in for anything like the position that he himself 
seem to want to defend. Um, but there are views such as those defended by, developed by Simon Blackburn and Alan Gibbard and Mike Ridge, which are in the lineage of air. And so they kind of take this as their starting point, but then they get very sophisticated. At the end of the day, they're going to say that even according to our air inspired view, uh, moral judgments uh, are not only truth apt, but some in fact are true. Um, but they do this by employing a whole bunch of conceptual machinery in which they end up, they end up understanding truth. And here I'm gonna be um, <laughs> uh, a little evasive because I don't wanna get into the details, but they end up understanding truth in a fairly thin way where truth does not consist in anything like a correspondence to the moral facts or anything like that. They do get understand in a much less committal way. So once they understand truth differently, they can say things like, yeah, moral judgments are true in this other sort of less committal thin sense, which doesn't, which doesn't commit us to there being moral facts in the world that make our moral judgments true. They reject that picture. Mm, yeah. I, you, you might, you mentioned uh, Simon Blackburn and mm -hmm. uh, obviously when, when I was like trying to just read briefly about all these theories, like obviously quasi-realism, which is the one yeah. advocated by Simon Blackburn was the one that's really hard to understand for me, at least for someone who's yeah. like, well, it is, it's, it's super difficult to understand period. Yeah. 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 Uh, and for me, and yeah, I, I'm just like, man, this is really, really hard. Like, uh, you know, I could like think about uh, stuff, you know, like uh, AJ was like, yeah, you know, quite straightforward this is how yeah. he looks at it but yeah when it comes to quasi realism it's like whoa this is a lot you know and yeah until today i still don't really have a good understanding of it yet but you know hopefully one day hopefully you're, you're uh, not alone it's 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 a very very difficult position to pin down um i've spent a lot of time thinking about it and writing about it although i haven't in recent years been thinking about it so much yeah it's it's um it's a it's an evasive position so it's not simply that it's conceptually sophisticated it's also i think that it's something of a moving target yep yep right so the next thing you know now that um we talk about whether moral morality uh, is truth app not then we can go down if we put aside non-cognitivism, we have the cognitivist position, which, which goes to like a couple, you know, you have like uh, the, the error theorists, right? So uh, the error theorists would say, yeah, moral, morality is truth at, but all of them are false, you know? So like, it's the equivalent of saying like, oh, uh, like for example, unicorns, you know, or maybe uh, how an atheist would say that god doesn't exist you know but we can talk about god right so we're still expressing some form of uh it's truth app but they're all false so for people like so you can still express a proposition right because propositions can be yeah, true or false but for er an error theories they are all like false uh and obviously we have just like how with the non-cognitivist you know you have a lineage of uh, yeah people who hold to that theory is the same with uh, error theories as well. You know, famously you have uh, Mackey, right? Uh, and then you also have, as I mentioned uh, just now in off record, uh, Joyce you and Bart Strumer, and like Jonas uh, Olsen, which is clear. Yeah, Jonas Olsen and uh, Strumer are kind of like a little bit more in the sense, uh, more contemporary, contemporary, like more yeah. recent. Uh, yeah. So, if we talk about Mackie, I think like the first thing that Mackie like really like hammers home is the queerness, right? Queerness used in that time, like strangeness or weirdness of morality. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can touch a little bit upon like uh, Mackie's uh, position, and uh, yeah, then we can just like go from 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 there and just like discuss the the rest briefly. Yeah, okay, so um, like non-cognitivism, the error theory, which as you uh, couched it, um, a view according to which uh, moral judgments and moral discourse is in the business of 
stating propositions, which can be true or false, but it turns out that none of them are true. And it's called the error theory because these philosophers hold that, yeah, ordinary people, when they engage in moral discourse and moral thought, they are uh, expressing propositions, they're believing these propositions and so forth, but it turns out that they're, they're massively in error. So just in the same way that the atheist might say that uh, religious people, they really do believe things about God. It's just all their beliefs are incorrect. There is no God. So it's sort of the equivalent of metaethics to, to atheism in, in when it comes to religion. Um, yeah, so Mackey, who publishes this book back in 1977, is widely regarded as, as well, offering kind of the the um really the first expression of the error theory in contemporary philosophy um there's some controversy as to whether it really is the view that he means to defend in this book but let's bracket that for a moment we'll just go with the uh the common understanding of Mackey yep um so Mackey Mackey's thinking is something like this hey if there were moral truths and moral facts, they would be these robustly objective features of reality that had properties like giving us very, very powerful reasons to act and magnetizing us to actions or pulling us to action. And Mackey reflects on this and he says to himself, God, that would be really weird if there were things like that, things that gave us overriding reasons to act regardless of what we care about and had this power of magnetizing us to, to action. So he says that would be too strange to exist. So um, we're better off being error theorists, acknowledging that ordinary people believe that morality is objective in this way, but they're just, they're just wrong. Yeah. And it, it, it is quite interesting as well, because like, I mean, we probably would talk a little bit about like, objections later when we come to your personal view that you hold or in relation to to those but there there are the like uh evolutions as well i'm actually quite uh intrigued by uh the view that bart strumer holds it's like which is he he says that oh the it is hard to believe that we are wrong but this makes it more likely to be true right some he holds something like that when when he wrote his like uh position on uh error theory yeah, unbelievable errors. Right, right. Yep. Um, yeah. So Bart has a pretty radical position, according to which, uh, yeah, there are no there are no moral reasons. There are no reasons at all. Um, um, this is the true view, <laughs> and um, uh, it's still one that he thinks is literally unbelievable. It's true, but we can't believe it. That's that's kind of the that's kind of the the, the approach he takes. Jonas Olson, um, also an theorist, doesn't want to say anything quite that radical. So there's a sort of division within the error theoretic camp between Jonas and Bart about how to think about the error theory, and and Richard Joyce for that matter. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because I read like uh, so in my head, like I know Mackey as like so-called the godfather of like error theory right and then yeah. the the next person i know is like obviously joyce here yeah. and which is a little bit i would say closer to mackie and then jonas olsen but then the only like how i stumbled upon bart was i saw a paper that bart was like responding to jonas olsen and i'm like aren't you guys the same team <laughs> you know like aren't you yeah. like in the error theory camp you know and yeah. then then it's like oh this yeah Bart Strumer holds a view that's quite, let's just put it very, very interesting, you know, to, yeah. to just yeah. read about. And it's like, like I said, it's a very radical position. Yeah. So they are, they are on the same team, but there are important differences between, what, between them. What would you say is the, like, the biggest point of contention between uh, Jonas Olsen and uh, Strumer's view? I, I think Jonas doesn't want to go so far to say uh, the error theory is literally unbelievable. He wants to say, no, this is a position that uh, people can believe. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, it's just like how far the pendulum swings, I guess. Uh, 
Now that's going to that's going to turn on uh, differences and how they're thinking about the nature of belief, how the uh, how they're thinking about reasons and so forth. That we don't need to get into here, but you know, yeah. these are sort of uh, quarrels they have amongst themselves. Yeah. I mean, when you were talking a little bit about like uh, going back to Simon Blackburn, you know, when they talk about what truth is, you know, there's so many, I mean, most people would like intuitively, like, I, would, I don't want to say most people, because I know saying that in the philosophical uh, sphere can be contentious. So I say like mm -hmm. people do hold like the correspondence of truth. And if you explain it to someone, uh, yeah, they say like, yeah, cool. That, that might be the position I would hold, right? But then when mm -hmm. it comes to philosophy, there's like, you know, truth-making properties, truth-makers, truth-makers, maximalism and all that, which I have no idea what those are. You know, I've just heard people talk about it and I usually like uh, zone off because it's like way too in-depth for me. And usually that's when I think that, you know, like I said, if people quarrel about what truth is and to kind of like talk about it, yeah, we know that is where the quarrel usually lies and which, you know, philosophies are like, a deep rabbit hole and so the next position we we will go into which is yeah coming closer to what you hold would be realism so i i think that realism state that yeah there's actually something like uh morality actually exists you know whether uh in a natural form uh, or a non-natural form so uh, like and i think that in the common language, people say, oh, okay, like realism usually falls into objective morality, you know, or yeah, yeah, that's how people would usually talk about uh, realism. So perhaps you can uh, and sketch out a little on like what the naturalistic uh, realism is. And also like this to tie back into the first uh, conversation that we had about more, and you said that more said that the question, the open question argument says that you cannot uh, sort of like reduce morality to something natural, natural, right? And how does that fare in in the face of like natural naturalistic realist theories? Yeah. Okay. So um, in contrast to the non cognitivists or the expressivists who believe at least the sort of most stark versions of the view want to maintain that moral thought and discourse is not assertoric, not expressing propositions that can be true or false. The realist rejects that. The realist says, no, 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 moral discourse and thought are expressing moral propositions, which are apt for truth and falsity. And unlike the error theorist, the realist says, hey, some of these propositions are true. And they're true in virtue of there being moral facts of certain kinds. Um, but then, then the view takes a step further. It wants to say that these, these moral facts are objective in a fairly robust sense. So uh, there are lots of theorists out there who believe in some sense we've invented morality, that in some sense we've created morality in the way that we created norms of etiquette or the rules of the road. Um, so there are etiquette facts or etiquette truths and they're truths about the rules of the road, um, but we're responsible for them. We made them up. Um, and what the realists wanna say is that morality is not like that. Morality uh, exists, but it's not something at, its, uh, at least it's foundational elements or stuff that, um, they're, they're not in any sense ones that hold due to our own cognitive activity or planning or agreements or anything like that. So they're objective in this sense. Um, realists will go on to say more than just that, but they'll say at least that. There are these moral truths, they're objective. They'll often say things like they give us really powerful reasons to act. And so that kind of forms the, the core of a realist view of morality. Um, but then there's a question about how to think about these moral truths or moral facts, whether they fit into the natural world that are described by the, the natural sciences, or in some interesting sense, like, no, they're not like that. They're, they're more similar to, they're more similar to the way a lot of people want to think about, say, um, the mathematical domain, which yep. is 
sort of abstract uh, that um, uh, are just sort of built into the the furniture of the fabric of the of the of the universe of reality. Um, so the question is, okay, um, are these the sort of things that are empirically discoverable and such that they would pull their explanatory weight in the natural sciences? Or are they discoverable by other means, broadly a priori means, and not such that they would uh, pull their um, weight in the natural sciences? This is really rough, but um, the naturalists want to say yes to these questions. They want to say yes, morality is empirically discoverable and basically only empirically discoverable. It's the sort of thing that that does explanatory work and or is poised to do such work or fitted to do such work in the natural sciences. Um, not physics or biology, the thinking is, but like sociology and psychology, we can give explanations of various sorts that appeal to moral truths and moral facts, why people act, why certain social movements take place and so forth. Mm. And the non-naturalist is really suspicious of this. Um, the non-naturalist wants to say, no, the, the mode of accessing these truths and facts isn't purely empirical. And it, it might be that these truths and facts play an explanatory role in the natural sciences, but that's not what they are at their core. Like that's not, if you wanna really talk about the essence of these facts or the essence of these truths, you wouldn't pack into the essence something like, hey, these things play you know, uh, explanatory roles in the sciences. Uh, the non-naturalist wants, wants to say, no, um, morality is, is autonomous in a, in, a, in a certain kind of way from um, all that. That's, that's in a sort of rough and ready way, the distinction where the naturalists want to fit moral reality into the so-called natural world and the non-naturalists aren't so concerned to do that, but they want to say that morality is real nonetheless. Yep, I think that's a like that's a wonderful sketch. You know, thanks for like going through uh, the distinctions between both camps, and I, like personally, from like coming from a science background, like you, like I would imagine that the natural sciences, uh, to an extent, you can be discovered uh, a posterior posteriori, right? That's what the mm -hmm. naturalists would say, you know, and but whereas. Uh, the non-naturalists would say, you know, uh, moral truths are discovered a priori, right? So uh, that I think that that's kind of like a distinction one can draw as well. So uh, naturalists is like, yeah, cool. They are very similar to like, in a way, science, uh, to put it uh, very kind of like in a layperson's form. Uh, mm -hmm. And when we come to uh, non-naturalistic realism, right? So they are like different positions as well. So for example, uh, your longtime uh, collaborator, you know, Russ Schaefer Landau has a particular uh, view where it's very like close to the philosophy of mind. Uh, you know, he, and he writes more about that in the book, his book, like Robust Ethics. And I think that um, he did say that there's difference between uh, having um, like a, minimalist realist view versus a robust realist view right like do you hold to like that kind of like distinction as well yeah there's this distinction just like there are disagreements within the error theory camp and disagreements within the non-cognitivist slash expressivist camp there are also disagreements among the realists not only with regard to whether moral reality is natural or non-natural but also those who want to those who want to align themselves with the non-naturalist tradition there are a whole bunch of philosophers um, um derek parfit and john skorupski and tim scanlon are, are people that come to mind who want to say look there are these moral truths they're not natural but in some interesting sense, 
these truths are not ontologically weighty. They don't, I think this is perfect way of putting it, they don't make any positive contribution to what there is. Now I find, I find all this quite elusive in much the same way I find quasi-realism pretty elusive. Um, what exactly have got in mind by ontologically light entities um, is n- tricky to, to suss out. Um, at any rate, uh, I reject all of it. Yeah, I, I think that um, uh, there are these truths and facts, and um, they're they're ontologically hefty. We can we can refer to them. We can predicate of them. They make um, uh, certain propositions true. Um, they might explain some sort some types of things. Um, so I um, I'm of the I'm of the view that uh, yeah they earn their keep in in um, in the world. Yep. So now now that you have like rejected certain uh, positions that like uh, Parfit uh, Scanlon holds, maybe you can briefly sketch out the position that you personally hold. You know I you wrote like two books on realism, so you wrote the normative web, uh, which uh, it's on the way via mail to my house because uh, oh, okay. everything yeah. takes takes a lot longer time in New Zealand yeah. and, and I have like a lot of books that I haven't read so I wait for like discounts so I found a discount and then I bought your book uh, and you also wrote another book called Speech and Morality so uh, I would say that you know if you write two books uh, on realism you do have certain thoughts on the topic so maybe you can briefly I mean it doesn't have to be brief just sketch out your view on your non-naturalistic uh, realism view yeah, so those two books um, are arguing for a fairly robust version of moral realism. But strictly speaking, neither book commits itself to non-naturalistic realism, uh, even though there have been plenty of people who've interpreted the first book in particular as being committed to non-naturalist realism. Um, I, I actually want to remain neutral um, in that book, and also the second book, quite explicitly, between naturalism and and non naturalism, just m- I'm more interested in arguing for realism in, in those books. Um, but for the last oh boy, nine years or so, Russ Schaefer Landau, who we just mentioned, and uh, John Bengtson, who is a philosopher at um, University of Texas, Austin, we've been working on a big project in metaethics. And the, and the primary aim of the project is to develop a non-naturalist, decidedly non-naturalist version of moral realism. So this is really supposed to be um, uh, an effort on our part to develop in the most sophisticated, thorough way, this type of position. Um, so that's what we've been working on. Um, I could sketch for you a bit how, how it all goes, um, but um, um, you know, very roughly, the approach we take is something like this. We think in order to construct a satisfactory meta-ethical theory, the thing you need to do is begin by collecting meta-ethical data. And some of this data concerns the nature of moral thought and discourse, um, and some of it concerns um, epistemology. So it seems to be a a datum that um, we can grasp certain moral truths. And there seems to be a data that certain actions are right and certain actions are wrong. That is to say, we have pretty good pre-theoretical reasons for believing these things. And so the thinking is that a good metaethical theory needs to handle these data. There are different ways of handling the data. And the way that we go about it is to say, realism is a position that's designed to accommodate, that is render probable and also explain these data. That's kind of what it's what it's up to. In contrast to, say, the error theory, which takes a look at these data and says, "Nope, you know, we're not we're not going to try to accommodate and explain these. We need to kind of explain them away, as it were." So, so realism is is this kind of view. It's trying to do to 
do justice to the appearances in this, in this regard. And um, most of our, we've got a couple books on this. Um, I think the first book will be out next year. Um, um, I should say, we just had a book come out this month, which is just about philosophical methodology. It's the methodology that we use in the books and metaethics. So there, there's that. That book is called Philosophical Methodology from Data to Theory. But that book doesn't have anything, it's not specifically dedicated to uh, metaethics. Um, but in the first of the metaethics books, what we want to say is that um, properly developed and supplemented, a realist view can explain these data um, and we can defend its various commitments that are in the business of uh, accommodating and explaining these data. And we think that there are certain data that uh, non-naturalism uh, is kind of best um, positioned to accommodate and, and, and explain. Um, so it's um, it's it's a position according to which it's it's primarily a development of realism, and along the way it says argues for the claim that the most promising version of realism is a non-naturalistic version of realism. That's that's kind of the approach that we. What well, is the approach that we take? Yeah, I yeah I look forward to those. Uh books for sure uh because people do say like the non-naturalistic realist position is like until recently has been like on the decline you know so uh like maybe yeah, i think yeah sociologically it's not true <laughs> it's uh there are a lot of non-naturalist realists um I, I think to the great surprise of people who sort of predicted the demise of this view um it was always i think very much alive in the uh, in the British context, um, but even now in the American context, it's it's a it might be the dominant view in realist metaethics. Yeah, there are there are a lot of people, a lot of really good philosophers who who uh, subscribe to the view. So I I think move, moving on, uh, the question now is that we've roughly sketched out uh, most positions, uh, at least popular positions uh, in the mathematical landscape. The question boils, boils down to why should one uh, embrace certain moral truths or like what gives it its uh, authority? You know, you, we mentioned the queer element that Mackie uh, wrote about, about its magnetism or you can say how it motivates, right? I think Mackie writes a little bit of how like these features need to have like motivation built into them. And yeah. so what, uh, how does that play a role? And I know as well, some people will say, oh, you know, uh, morality simply boils down to rationality. You know, it's because uh, rational people uh, would embrace morality, morality of this form. So perhaps, we, you can kind of like explicate a little on like uh, the motivation, uh, desires, authoritativeness of morality and the rational element, whether morality ultimately, I wouldn't say reducible, but you know, like is grounded in some form of like reasons and rationality. Yeah, um, okay, this gets, this gets pretty complicated pretty quickly. So along with many other philosophers, what I would like to do is distinguish motives on the one hand from reasons on the other hand. So motives are the sorts of things that um, move us to act or in light of which agent, agents act. Reasons are the sorts of things that favor acting, justify acting. And um, it's a matter of great controversy whether reasons have to be, um, have any sort of intimate connection with with motives and motivation. Um, but once we, once we distinguish these two things, I think it's much more important to robust realist views that they accept views according to which there are 
excellent moral reasons, or this is not to be understood in terms of motivation at all, but in terms of what favors action. And what I mean by excellent moral reasons, uh, I'll use this term strong moral reasons. Um, maybe that's better. I, I, I mean by this, that the, these reasons are weighty. They don't necessarily override all other competing reasons, but in a wide range of cases, um, they went out. Um, so they're not easily trumped by considerations of self-interest or, consider or aesthetic considerations or considerations of prudence, for example. Um, and also they're, they're categorical in the sense that um, whether certain um, considerations favor acting in certain kinds of ways isn't contingent on our desires, what motives we may happen to have. Rather, um, they're features of the world, such as other people being in pain or other people suffering, um, which give us reasons to act and that those reasons are not grounded in anything that I might care about. Okay, so that's, that's, um, that's the distinction between motives and reasons and realism wants to say that there are strong moral reasons. Um, now, there are a lot of different ways to go about defending this idea that there are, are strong moral reasons. And in the, in the book that I just mentioned, um, John Bankson and Russ Schaefer-Landau and I defend this view and offer uh, an account of, of strong moral realism um, reasons there. But, um, you know, maybe more intuitively, it's... it's um, we can say two things before getting into the nitty gritty arguments. The first thing is that views which reject the idea that there are strong moral reasons um, seem to have some pretty counterintuitive implications. You know, so again, so suppose you believe that, yeah, you have reasons to act morally, but you, you have reasons to act morally only because you care about Morality. If you didn't care about morality, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have these reasons. The problem is, is that you know, if you're, for example, sitting on the beach in New Zealand and you're and you're watching someone drown who you could easily save, and you don't do anything about it, and I ask you, hey, why didn't you do anything about it? And you say, look, I don't really care about morality. You know, I don't care about uh, other people on the beach. In fact. That seems, and, and so from the, the, a view according to which there are no strong moral reasons, you, you'd be off the hook in, in a certain kind of way. You wouldn't have made a, a deep mistake. You had no reason, no moral reason to act that way. So that seems highly counterintuitive. It seems like, no, 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 no. You, you have moral reason to go and get in the water and save the person who's drowning if you can easily do it. So, so one thing that a view has going for it um, is that it's it's yielding the right sort of first order moral. In, it's getting it's getting the sort of right first order moral implications according to which yes you do have moral reasons to act in this way regardless of what you care about. And then the second thing to note is that morality is probably not that unique in this regard, and the, and this um, this ties into the first book that I wrote published back in 2007, The Normative Web. If you think about the epistemic domain, epistemic domain, think, think of that roughly as concerning um, justification and warrant and entitlement for our beliefs. Um, a lot of those reasons, the epistemic reasons we have to believe propositions such as, hey, you've got reason to believe there's like really, really powerful evidence in favor of a proposition and like almost nothing to be said against it. Yeah, you have very powerful reason to believe it. Um, that, looks like, that looks like what I'm calling a strong reason. It's very powerful. And whether you have strong reason to believe um, propositions that are um, 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 supported by excellent evidence doesn't seem to be contingent on anything you care about. Now, if you if you said, "Look, I don't care about truth," or, or anything like that, that would cut no ice, right? It's like, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. You, it, it's, you've got strong reason to believe 
propositions of this sort. So the second thing to say is that it's contrary to what Mackey and some people say, it's not like morality is like totally unique in this regard. Uh, rather, when you look at a domain such as epistemology, it seems to share many of the same features that a lot of us think that morality would have, um, does have. Yep. So, yeah, it goes back down to you drawing the similarities between, uh, like I said, in, in normative web. And like one, one can raise an uh, objection saying that, yeah, uh, our, our intuitions right now con conditioned by the cultural and social environment. You know, maybe let's just say in the 1500s, if I saw someone who is drowning uh, and that I could easily save, uh, but I didn't, uh, maybe during that time, uh, it's, I wouldn't be sort of like blameworthy or like there are no strong reasons for that. Or to put it in another manner, let's just say it's like a different species from a different planet. And in their sense, morality is basically preservation of like your own self-interest, right? Uh, so if there's no like potential, like immediate benefit that I can see, I won't have to do it. Let's just say an alien race and this is their, their sort of like their law. So how would you sort of like adjudicate between those positions? Well, I think the first observation would be something like, we're wrong and have been wrong about a lot of things. We've been um, way off base with regard to a lot of our scientific beliefs, a lot of our religious beliefs, um, important parts of so-called common sense have been way off. You know, so, so the fact that we fall into error is not surprising. That the, the fact that some people fall into error with regard to morality is not surprising either. It's just kind of the human condition. So one, but we have made progress. We have, we have figured out that um, it's, not, it's not the case that um, only certain people who, who have certain kinds of social standings or certain kinds of ethnic identities. So we, contrary to what Aristotle seemed to think, it's not the case that only Athenians matter, right? Yeah. And friends of Athenians. No, it's, it's human beings that, that matter, human persons that matter. So, um, so, so it seems like we've made a lot of progress. We've, we've kind of emerged from broadly tribalistic types of ways of thinking to, to something that's much better, much more principled, much, much more coherent. And so, you know, if you were to go back and say, hey, that's Aristotle on the beach in New Zealand, and he's watching a Spartan drown, and he's thinking to himself, oh, who cares about the Spartan? It's a Spartan, right? Um, or he's, he's watching a slave drown, and say, wow, who cares about slaves, right? Um, the, these people have sort of uh, inferior natures. Aristotle was just being correct about it just in the same way that he was incorrect about all sorts of claims in physics and biology and so forth and mathematics and logic. It's just wrong. Um, so that's the, that's, the, that's the type of reply I'd be inclined to give about that, that sort of case. Um, you know, the, the alien case is, is maybe a little bit more interesting, um, but without seeing the case fleshed out more, more concretely, um, I don't think there's any reason, right off the bat at least, to think like, oh, yeah, the aliens are you know, superior moral agents or anything like that. Well, no, they may be blind to these sorts of things too, just in the way that Aristotle was. Mm. And I, yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't mean to say that, that Aristotle was wholly blind to these things. He, he had a lot, a lot of perceptive things to say about the domain of ethics. It's, it's just that there were some really serious blind spots as well. Yep. So I, I guess what, so if like, I mean, obviously Aristotle is like one of like the greats, you know, philosophy, right? People usually, sure. people yeah. usually know who Aristotle is, even if they don't know who, what, 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 what right. philosophy is at all. What, what justification do we have to think that we now can be right? You know, if Aristotle was once wrong, could that be 
because I obviously draw the case to be like one like years back. But what if we like projected years in the future? Could we actually be wrong? And some form of case that probably is a little bit more uh, similar to Aristotle's case was right, you know? So like, Sure, we could be wrong about lots of stuff. I mean, I think there's some powerful reason. There, there, I think there's powerful reason to believe that we've been wrong about the moral standing of, of non-human animals. Mm. For the longest time, we've, we've thought, oh, non-human animals, oh, I mean, we can basically do what we want with them. Um, and I think um, philosophers have made a very powerful case that that's just not true. They have rights of various sorts. They have, they have moral standing of various sorts. They, don't, they can't use moral concepts in the same way that we can, but nevertheless, they are the sorts of creatures that can suffer pleasure and pain, can have worse or better lives, can have very sophisticated and interesting lives, form bonds of kinship and so on and so forth. So I think that would be another case in which we might say, oh yeah, we were incorrect in sort of thinking that animals didn't um, deserve uh, uh, much better treatment than uh, in fact we, we've given them. So yeah, I, I think there's, there's room for improvement and we can see perhaps the direction that uh, the, the improvement needs to go. Hmm. Yep. I guess the last part for this uh, conversation is something I want to touch on a little bit maybe a little bit more personal rather than from your intellectual side, right? Uh, because I know that- We can talk about fitness. <laughs> I mean, we, we can do a completely different podcast on that and you can interview me because obviously now I'm, you're the one giving and I'm the one receiving, you know, if you want to. I always tell people that I speak to that are not in fitness. If you want any like fitness tips, you know, uh, you know feel free to ask me. I usually <laughs> can point you towards the right direction, especially when it comes to food because personally, I'm a food lover. Okay, but, great. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, like completely being serious about that, by the way. So if you if you actually have anything on your mind regarding to that, uh, please feel free. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, I'm I'm interested in these issues. I've got kids who are athletes, and oh yeah, that, I, I think it's important. You know, like yeah. uh, it's just important because let's just put it uh in a way that fitness the industry is so unregulated, right? So it's yeah. it helps to you know. Uh, and yeah, I I don't quote my my recommendations lightly because being science, they always say cite your sources. Uh, yeah. And I, I think that that's one good, good thing about science. Uh, it's not just citing your sources, but we actually, coming from science, I actually really dislike like the way philo uh, philosophy texts are like, they use footnotes. You know, it's like when you write, it's really difficult because science, you just put a number and you put the citations behind, right? But this one, you have to like <laughs> cite your footnotes at the bottom. But yeah, completely unrelated. Uh, but... You, you mentioned your collaborators just now, uh, John Banks and yeah. Russ Schaefer Landau. Yeah. I, I know yeah. that uh, Russ uh, is an atheist and you are a theist, right? In fact, I didn't mention this at the start because I want to like throw it at the end, but you are actually like the current uh, president for the Society of Christian Philosophers. Is that, yeah. is that, yeah. So, and I know that when it comes to, and you mentioned a little bit on your work on philosophy of religion. Uh, so when, and the big part that's, a big like moral argument right uh for like the existence of god and i know that when you write your mathematical positions you never like add a theistic element into that is there a specific reason why or why not and i mean it, as a mathematician if you if you don't find like the moral argument for god compelling you can just say so because richard swinburne basically said yeah you know i don't think the moral argument is good at all so uh, uh -huh. you're, yeah. you're, you're in good company you know uh, if, if, yeah. if you think that that is uh, your position. Yeah, this is this is interesting. Um, I get this question a lot. I think people, I think probably legitimately think, oh, here's this person who works and thinks hard about metaethics and also is religiously committed and thinks hard about issues in religion, does foster religion. So they they must they must intersect in his own mind, but. The truth is they intersect much less than <laughs> they intersect much less than and than you might think. Um, so moral arguments for the existence of God. There might be some okay ones, I, get, I suppose, maybe. Um, I think some of the things that Nick Walterstorff argues. 
with regard to human rights and the best the best grounds for human rights being theistic grounding. I think that's those arguments are interesting. Um, theism does have, uh, I think, the implication that we would always have powerful reasons to conform to moral reasons. So they offer a certain kind of explanation, which might be quite good of the strength of moral reason. So it may be that theism does some interesting work um, with regard to morality. And it might be that the moral truth is ultimately grounded in the essence of God or something like that. I, I, I think a view like that, if you're a theist, is probably the way to go. Mm. Yeah. Um, um, but I haven't worked all this out. Um, yeah, I've been so busy with the other stuff <laughs> that it's not it's not something I've devoted uh, a lot of time or attention to. Um, so I, I know that's gonna that's probably gonna be disappointing, but that's that's the way things are. I'm, I mean, that's fair. I just like, yeah, the, the honest answer is always the best answer, you know. And I do think that even in theistic ethics, there's different like strands, right? Like, yeah. uh, like divine command theories, uh, right? Uh, you know, like divine motivation uh like theories like linda zazebski you know uh and i know yep. like you have people like mark murphy which is like vehemently opposed to divine command theories you know so it's like uh yep. and obviously in a little bit more of like the the catholic uh you have like natural law theories and, and things like that so mm -hmm. i mean th there's like huge like strand of uh, theories people can can yeah can can hold on to uh and i do think that some most of them have like they are like they offer like compelling uh arguments like uh, in the philosophical sphere you know but yeah i, I like like i know walter stuff like uh isn't a divine commentary because in his book he clearly wrote against uh yeah that's uh, right uh, a divine commentary uh, yeah. but but yeah i think that that's like interesting and you also mentioned because a little bit about like how it doesn't really like intersect in your in your head it yeah. kind of like reminds me about like I think I heard a podcast where someone interviewed uh, like Russ Schaefer and down once and he was like, you know, I only do any things in like meta ethics. I don't like read like stuff outside because in my free time, I like to do things that are not related to philosophy, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, he, so he, <laughs> yeah, he says that uh, he likes music, you know, so uh, that's usually what he does on his free time. And yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. that, I think you're similar uh, uh, as well in the sense, because I've seen like on your, I think on your site, you have like, a video of you playing the guitar or something like that. Yeah, you know? yeah, I'm so, an avid guitar player. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So do you and like Russ like jam to like we, songs? He's together? a drummer. We but we have never jammed. Uh, yeah. It's got to happen someday. But yeah. We, we, yeah. It, we've it, never done it. Yeah. It's you. That, that's definitely like your your next project. If like John Benson plays an instrument as well, you know, you can form a band. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm confident that John does not play an instrument. <laughs> I mean, you, you. He may be able to sing. You know, you're like. For all like the funny names out there, your band could be like Mathematical Realism, and to like most people out there, they'd be like, "Oh, this sounds like a cool band name," you know. The non the non naturalist, right? right. Yeah, and um, yeah, things like that. Yeah, but yeah. So so, um, you know, maybe maybe in the future I'll think harder about these these issues. It's just that my most of my energies have been consumed, um, um thinking about meta ethical questions more broadly and defending realism, developing non-naturalism, and haven't yet sort of figured out in the, the ways in which they, these commitments intersect with theism. Yeah, and yeah. I think the, like, the reason why I ask as well is because uh, obviously to hold like a non-naturalistic position uh, for ethics, it's a little bit closer to like the theistic strand, right? So it's like, obviously if you're a big like mathematician that uh, holds to like oh cool uh yeah anti-realist yeah. position people yeah intuitively yeah. people seem like it's a little bit further away uh but yeah so i'm just like curious whether because like how it intersects uh i because i know that uh like david baggett and john hare has like a big book anthology project on like the moral argument and i uh he he's basically getting like they, they are getting a bunch of like uh mathematicians to write like chapters on it and and, and things like that so uh, obviously in the it's quite exciting to see uh things like that 
come out. Yeah, I think I'm supposed to write something for that on the error theory. Yeah. So yeah. when when it does come out, like uh, I I would definitely be uh, looking forward to read all the entries. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. That should be very interesting. Yeah, and yeah, uh, we we didn't have much time to talk about your like uh, liturgy and re- like ritual experience, but uh, maybe you can just like give a like really brief sketch. And if people do want to read more about that, because I do think that it's it's part of like what you do as well. So I don't want to like discount that. Uh, so maybe you can just like share with us really briefly what that consists of and uh, and why that's a particular interest because it's quite distinct from whatever else you do, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's true. When I write on this stuff, it almost feels like I'm just using another part of my mind altogether than the, the part of my mind I used to think about meta ethics. But, you know, but broadly speaking, um, so... Um, uh, I'm a religiously committed person. My home tradition is Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And um, that tradition is one in which liturgy functions very prominently, features very prominently. And so um, my work in liturgy has been keyed into and inspired by my experiencing my experience as a practicing Eastern Orthodox Christian. And there's been very, very little, almost nothing written about it from a philosophical point of view. So I found myself just puzzled by a lot of features of the liturgy and what goes on in religious ritual and so forth. And, and so started reflecting on these things and, and, and writing about them. And so in 2016, um, I published a book called Ritualized Faith, which um, it is a collection of different essays in the philosophy of liturgy. Yeah. So for listen, listeners who want to check that out, uh, please go ahead and uh, look up that book. And I think that one thing that people like do discount a lot when it comes to at least compelling reasons to adopt faith or like religion is like the religious experience. Uh, I, I heard people spoke to me before that at least in current uh uh, like I would say evangelic uh, like evangelicalism I can't pronounce it but they, mm-hmm. they lose a lot of that like uh, like liturgy that the rituals you know that yeah. truly evoke that sense of like religious experience because you know you go in right. and sometimes you walk into like a concert at the bar next door you pretty much feel the same thing you know so like it, and that's like kind of like turning people away to uh, from particular like christian tradition towards more like yeah eastern orthodoxy or like roman yeah. c- catholicism and and things like that so i i do think that that's a important component and like i said i don't see people writing much about it at all and that's right yeah so yeah i, I find that like fascinating because uh people yeah, so do i yeah people <laughs> like people discount that a lot i think that uh i think experience is a uh, it's it, it's like very like important you know even in like philosophical literature people sure. talk about like uh, idealism right people like idealists literally believe like our world is like mental experience like and that is like the core of it right so to discount like experience uh i think people would be making a huge stretch if they don't uh accommodate how much experience plays into someone's uh life so yeah yeah and yeah, yeah i guess uh that's all for this podcast uh i thank you so much for your time you know uh before we end maybe perhaps uh, yeah share with us if people would uh like to find more of your work uh where can they uh look for look for some of your like where does it publish books or articles that you write oh yeah so philosophy is a discipline in which much of the work that we do is uh, published in journals so they're essays uh, published in journals um some of us work on books um and i'm one of those people i've published a book entitled the normative web that's an oxford university press and another book called speech and morality which is an oxford university press um and then i there's the book i just mentioned ritualized faith which is an oxford university press then in 2020 i publish a small book on Thomas Reed on Cambridge University Press called Thomas Reed and the Ethical Life. And then there's this book that um, Bengtson, Schaefer Landau and I just uh, 
published called Philosophical Methodology. And that's, um, that's, uh, that's out on Oxford University Press as well, just came out. Um, and we have another one that's coming down the pipe. Um, there are a lot of essays that um, I've written over the years. I, there are a couple of ways to get a hold of them. One of one of the ways to get a hold of them is just to email me at tcunio at uvm.edu. I'd be happy to send you copies, but I, there's also a, um, it's got a website where, in which um, a lot of these essays are available. Yep, I'll put all uh, all of those links into the show notes. And obviously, uh, for the first part of the conversation, uh, like uh, Dr. Cunio and I talked about like. The lay of the land you know if you all want to go into like deeper into that uh dr cuneo also edited a book with like rashi valendau called uh, foundations of ethics i think that's yeah. a that's a really good book and i think most people interested in meta ethics should actually like get that you know i think that's uh really yeah. uh great you know the, the only things the only problem i have with this kind of books is that university press comes out with like really ugly like covers you know, like the, the, the covers of the books aren't really like the most appealing. And sometimes it's yeah. like completely unrelated to like the topic, you know, but yeah, it, but yeah that's yeah. yeah completely different. But yeah, that's a like fantastic book. And do check out uh, all the links in the show notes uh, to all our listeners out there. You know, once in a while, we, instead of challenging the body, uh, I like to challenge your mind. So hopefully your mind has been challenged uh, during this podcast episode. If you like this episode, uh, don't forget to share it. Uh, subscribe, uh, hit the bell on the YouTube button if you're watching this on YouTube and uh, we'll see all of you next time.